All right, so hello. So I'm gonna show you how to use this uh, nice secure G board with the Chip Whisperer um, software using a regular oscilloscope. So no special hardware. Um, so the secure G is just this um, very convenient FPGA test platform, which um, you may already have or you know have access to or be interested in getting. And I'm going to show you how I'm going to use this PicoScope device here to capture it and break an AES reference implementation that's on the um, on the FPGA. So the FPGA get a pen here is this top big one you can see um, here. So this is the Spartan Six LX75, um, and it has a resistor here that is doing that you can measure the power across. And to reduce noise, there's a built-in amplifier on the board, which you can then connect to your regular oscilloscope. So that's what this line does here, which goes to the picoscope. Um, and the other line here is the trigger. So this channel, I'm using the trigger here. And then we just have USB for comms. So let's turn that off. And let's turn on the special capture hardware, or capture software, sorry. So this is the Chip Whisperer system. So I previously shown you the Chip Whisperer with um, some of my custom hardware with the OpenADC, uh, which is great if you don't already have an oscilloscope or sufficiently uh, high speed enough oscilloscope if you do then you may just want to use um, use what you already have. So I'll show you how you can do that. So first I'm going to select the Secure G as the target. Um, and it's a standalone version, so it's not the one with the OpenADC mounted. I enumerate it so it finds the uh, the serial number. And in the Secure G, it's the A. The Sasebo G2 often uses the B, so this is just two different channels that the USB chip has. Um, so if I hit connect, it connected to it, and if we want to just test it, if you open the monitor here, you can just test and you hit play one. Um, all it does is it sends a plain text, encrypts it, and gets the response. Pretty cool. All right, so what to do next? Um, now we're going to select the PicoScope as the scope module and go over to scope settings and make sure we select the 6000 series. Um, which is this device, and I'll just hit connect. And after a second, the scope you hear it power up, and we're running. So uh, we can hit capture one just to see if things are working, and that looks pretty good. So we can make some adjustments. You can adjust the sample rate. Um, so here we have 156 mega samples per second. You can, you know, change that around. Uh, this is running at 1.5 megahertz, so that should be enough, I think. And I am going to reduce the sample length. And yep, that's looking good. So you may need to adjust the trigger. Um, the default is using the B channel. So this is um, a front, front channel um, here. So this is channel B is the trigger. As a note, you may want to use the external auxiliary trigger input, which is a rear connector on the oscilloscope. Um, this will let you use the scope at the maximum possible sampling rate. So the problem is that because I'm using the B channel as the trigger, the B channel gets turned on. And this scope could do five giga samples per second on just the A channel. Um, because I have A and B enabled, it limits you to 2.5 giga samples per second. If you use the A channel plus the auxiliary trigger, you can still get five giga samples anyway. And uh, I'll adjust down the Y range to be as small as possible without going into if it's too small, you'll see we get this overflow warning. So we don't want that. All right, so that looks pretty dang good. And we will select how many traces we want, say 4,000 traces. And the last thing you have to do is you have to select the trace format. If you don't do this and you capture, uh, it's not going to save the data anywhere. It's going to capture it, but that's it. So now we go, and you can see it counting up at the bottom here. Trace 100 traces done. 
um, etc. So I'll come back once this has uh, recorded closer to 4,000. All right, so here we can see it just finished um, the 4,000 races. So I'll save the project. Um, I'm gonna overwrite. I had done another example and I forgot to enable the um, enable the trace writer, so there's no data. So there we have the traces. Um, next, I fire up the analysis software. So this has recorded them in a format that you could actually just dump to MATLAB or something like that. You do not have to use the analyzer side at all. And if you're interested in your own attacks, you may um, you may just want to do that. But I'll show you the analyzer side anyway. Um, so I open the traces, enable it, and we can, for example, we can look at them just as they were recorded. And what's probably more interesting is if I plot a bunch of traces on top of each other. Okay, so see something. Um, but, and you can just run the attack like this. Um, but what I'm actually going to do first is I'm going to put a little bit of analog filtering. So I've done this attack previously and I found a bit of a uh, low pass filtering actually seems to improve the results. So you can configure the, um, the form of it, the critical frequency and whatnot. Uh, so I'm just going to leave that all at default and take a look at what it looks like. So you can increase the critical frequency if you want and see how that uh, affects the result. So let's do something like, say, 0.7. So obviously I'm just looking at them here, but what you should be doing is... Uh, running the attack and comparing the results using different um, different options. You could also use some resynchronization as a pre-processing if needed, although here the traces look quite well synchronized. Uh, so what's critical is to change the default attack to hamming distance, because this is hardware, and um, using attacking the last round. So we'll assume initially that we don't really know much else, and we're just going to leave everything else at defaults. Uh, so what this will do, it will run all 4,000 traces through um, one attack run, and every 100 traces it's going to be reporting the current results in terms of the partial guessing entropy. So let's just hit run, and I'll show you how we can uh, use the results to uh, improve some of our guessing as we go. Uh, so this is just going through each of the 16 subkeys um, using the first 100 traces. And we can see what this is showing us is um, it's ranking the output. And the red is the correct key. The correct key being the one we know because we've uh, when we did the attack, we saved what the key is we used. Um, and this table will just keep updating. So we can see that so far we're not really making much progress at all. Um, the partial guessing entropies are at the top here. They're not really progressing at all. And then this is showing for each of the subkeys what the actual ranking is. So, you know, if there's a partial guessing entropy of two, this is meaning that there's two false keys in front of the correct key. Um, obviously, early on when there's, it's basically just uh, noise, you don't see, uh, you may see them bounce up to zero and it may be just random. Obviously it's once it stays there, that's a better indication that things are working. So now we can start to see these partial guessing entries improve. Um, you can plot how they're advancing over time for each of the sub keys. And what's probably more interesting is if we take a look at a key we know, so let's see sub key 12 um, seems to be pretty well known, 12 and 13 even. And um, let's look at the correlation over time. And what you can see is that, hey, it looks like everything of interest is happening somewhere in this area here. Um, between maybe, you know, time point 1140 and 1200. So I'm actually going to stop the attack. And we are going to limit ourselves to actually using an attack that's just on this area. And I'm just going to fine tune it a little more. And we'll go to 1200, so that's fine. 
Um, so now the attack is just going to be concentrated on this one area. So we'll just turn that off. And we're actually going to redo it now. Um, but what you can see is that it's running somewhat faster uh, because it's not having to go through the entire points. It's just going through the um, that smaller subset of points. So this whole system's written in Python. It's not as fast as you could possibly make it, especially compared to something like C. But you can see that having the uh, the graphical tools makes it kind of interesting to be able to easily adjust things and go back. Um, so we can already start to see, and in fact, we're probably getting slightly better results because we don't have all the uh, randomness from the rest of the system. We're concentrating just on the area of interest. Um, and you can plot these, and you can see some of the partial guessing entropy starting to come down already. And again, we just sort of can wait for the uh, the attack to complete until we are successful across all of the subkeys. Um, because the partial guessing entropies will be a little bit random, obviously, this is just a single attack, what the software also allows you to do is I can say that I want to run, for example, four attacks where each attack only uses a thousand traces, and then we will get a average partial guessing entropy, so each subkey's partial guessing entropy will be averaged over the four attacks, so it will smooth it out. Um, ideally, you want to do quite a few attacks, you know, 10 or 100, to get um, a really nice looking curve. So here we can see where subkey 14 seems to be giving us uh, problems, by 14 of the, of the key, but the rest of them have almost all fallen into line here. Um, so I don't know if I did something, if I cut off when I uh, selected the starting and ending point wrong. There could have been a problem with the filter setting. But again, it's all things that you can um, play with and having the GUI makes it a little easier. So let's turn all these on. So we can see almost all of them have um, collapsed down to either zero or one. Again, except for, for some reason, this one subkey is giving us issues. Um, so there it's more or less falling into line. So we can, if you want, you can wait until, you know, it, everything goes to zero, but you can see that we have effectively recovered the secret key um, that was running on the Sakura G in hardware AES. And this is using the entirely open source Chip Whisperer software. Uh, so I hope you take the time to use it and enjoy it. And I'll stop the attack here because we've now been completely successful. And for example, you could run the same thing, except with a different uh, critical frequency if you want to see the effect of low-pass filtering um, or whatnot. But I hope you enjoyed it.